And uh, I found that there weren't really any good definitions, or at least ones that I was happy with. So just because I come up with a design, you know, it doesn't mean it's right. It's just that in about eight years using it, nobody's challenged it. So I'm going to use it, and it's useful to talk about in class. So we'll start there, and then we'll talk about why we talk about design process and, and work our way into a sustainable design process. Okay? So I use this definition. Design is both creative and hard-nosed at the same time. So you're making decisions. You need concepts. There's creativity involved. But at the end of the day, you're trading off between cost, quality, performance, time to market, environmental attributes. And so the trade-offs are front and center in design. And you may just be satisfying one customer, but th these days we almost always think more broadly, at least to our shareholders, and uh, even more broadly now to uh, issues of the environment. All right, so uh, just to read it, a creative decision-making process that aims to find an optimal balance of trade-offs in the conception of an artifact that best satisfies customer and other stakeholder preferences. Does anybody object to the definition? We can use it. Uh, yeah, go ahead. How do we quantify best? Uh, great question. Uh, we don't right now. Uh, so uh, in the end, uh, you know, this is, whether we're talking about sustainable design, whether we're talking about product design, this is what engineers do, right? They got to figure out what's best. And they do that with their bosses and with their you know, corporate bottom line and the enterprise in mind. Some things are quantitative and some things aren't. And at the end of the day, you put it all together. Well, we could add that feature, but we think that quality is going to go down. We may have more defects. Do you have numbers on that? You never do. You just have a sense based on experience, based on expertise, based on what others have seen. Uh, the cost may go up by a nickel, and we may only make two cents on the price on that. So we're not going to do it. But you never really know that in advance, right? These kinds of decisions happen in business all the time. And it's no different for sustainable design, which is why it's sort of a natural uh, conclusion. So yeah, I mean, who comes up with numbers like this? Yeah, I wouldn't believe them, believe them either. You know? Why do we focus on design? Well, I think we all know that design decisions have a big impact on the cost of a product, right? If I design this product versus that product, uh, it's going to make a big difference in the cost. So the design stage is where you have the most leverage. You know, if you want to affect a, um, a product by just you know, trying to change the materials, you may only be able to affect 20% of the cost, at least according to this study by Thompson here. Now, I don't believe these numbers. The main idea here is that the design stage is where you have the leverage. You know, you're not going to have much success changing labor costs, for instance. Right? That's going to be a union contract, what have you. That's the point. Design's where you've got an opportunity. So you want your design process to yield uh, good outcomes. So how do you guarantee that? Just like the sustainable lighting design exercise. How do you guarantee that? Right? Well, there's design process for that. Design process is just a mapping. Think about the design need, your knowledge, and how you map the need and knowledge into the resulting product. That is what uh, a design process is. It structures that conversion of your uh, subject knowledge, uh, what you know about design process, uh, the design need, taking that all together. If you didn't have design process knowledge, you're just sort of shooting in the dark. Right? I've got this idea of what the need is, but if I don't structure the customer requirements in some way, maybe I'm missing something. Design process is where you recognize that I need to structure the design requirements. Uh, for instance, so uh, Ullman here is a sort of famous uh, person who writes about design process. Uh, David Ullman, he, you know, he has this figure here saying you need uh, to understand your customer, you need to understand your domain, but you also need to understand the process that you're going to use. And that uh, will lead to better products than other ways of thinking about it. And I think I can convince you of that um, fairly quickly. This is just a generic design process. Um, I've overseen the creation of over 500 projects in senior design in about 10 years. And all of them can use this process. It's very generic is the point. 
you begin with the definition stage. All right, well, what is the, what's the real problem here? Who's the customer? Uh, what are the specifications? How do we generate those specifications from the requirements? And you define what the product is trying to do. Stage one, it's called the definition stage. Once you know what you're trying to do, you generate concepts, as many as you can, and you do this without any um, critique. You're aiming for hundreds of thousands of concepts. Then you whittle them down in what's called the transition stage. Sort of rough evaluation. You don't want to do a finite element computational analysis of every one of those thousand designs. That'd be ridiculous. Uh, really, you're just checking the laws of physics here, whether they might make sense, go, no, go. And um, you know, maybe in that process, you're going to come up with a new idea, and that's going to sort of bounce you back to this divergent stage, different ways of doing things. Once you've uh, gone back and forth for a while, start to come up with some concepts that you're really serious about, then you, you, know, you do that design optimization. You try to answer the question, what is the best of these alternatives? And then uh, you're going to prototype a few, and hopefully you're going to land on that one that's going to make your company a whole lot of money without uh, um, you know, affecting the, the planet adversely. So this is just a generic design process. Uh, does everybody understand how the, I call it the football diagram? What's going on here? You, you figure out what the product is, come up with concepts, rough evaluation. Uh, then you, you find some concepts you're serious about, do that design optimization, uh, prototype the, the very few that you're serious about, test them out, do your uh, consumer surveys. If they don't like any of them, go back to the beginning, uh, unless you don't have time. And then you just try to sell it anyway. Happens a lot. Make sense? All right, where does sustainable design fit in? Uh, this is quality function deployment. How many people have heard of QFD? Most people. Uh, who can explain quality function deployment? What is this house? Of ranking trade-offs between different features, or depending on which level you're looking at, different um, new materials if you're working at a part level, but it identifies what your goals are, which parts of the product are achieving those goals, and it kind of gives a qualitative or quantitative view of looking out properly, um, indicator of which areas you might have problems with and where you might come into conflict. So you can, you can put multiple houses together that take you from the specifications uh, into, uh, or let's say the customer requirements, sorry, into the specification. And then the specifications can become this axis. And then you've got embodiment concepts. And you can evaluate one after the next. And you can take it all the way from the sort of what the customer wants to what you've designed. This is uh, what's sometimes called the first house. And you're looking at requirements over here where you know, they may be quality requirements, they may be environmental requirements, they may be cost requirements. And they're coming from the broader stakeholders that we're talking about. Then you say, OK, well, um, you know, how do I, uh, you know, if, if I'm making an engine uh, and I, you know, I need that engine uh, to be strong, I'm going to think about the mechanical strength of the engine. And so that becomes a specification, something with a unit. So you can do this for quality uh, requirements. You can do this for cost requirements. You can do this for environmental requirements. The point is that quality function deployment, and there's a whole reading on this, which is optional. Quality function deployment is a way of transmitting customer requirements into engineering specifications. And you can broaden that to include environmental uh, requirements or goals. So how do you fit? sustainability environment into a sustainable design process. Well, this makes it pretty easy if you're using a very common approach. I think this was introduced in the 70s for the first time, House of Quality. OK. Does that make sense? This is in the definition stage, problem definition. How can we integrate sustainability into concept generation? Well, we can think of each of these functions as we think of thousands of different, or let's say tens of different ways to perform each of these functions, and we multiply them together, and we get thousands of concepts, each of those we can look at them with respect to the lids wheel. 
and we can use the lids wheel to inspire a new concept. Multiply them together, and you know you can get again hundreds of concepts very quickly. Right? So this is just using functional decomposition as a concept generation tool. So like I said already, you can use functional decomposition to evaluate an existing product, or you can use it to inspire a new product. And this is in the, the latter, inspiring a new product. Does this make sense? This is concept selection. So now we've generated thousands of concepts. Like I said already, you don't want to do the optimized design for each one of those. You want a rough evaluation first, and you want to increase your resolution as you move from having many concepts to the ones that you want to develop. Uh, for the, the ultra bold here, there's actually a podcast. So uh, you'll see it as reading number 35, or when you look at this uh, PDF I'm going to create, you can click right here. And there's about 70 minutes or so of concept selection, I'm sorry, concept generation and concept selection. So if people are interested in that, the whole lecture on that is totally optional. The main point here is that you're first looking at the feasibility of concepts. You want to make sure that whatever technology that those concepts are relying on, that that's ready to go. Uh, if it isn't, you cut it off. So at each one of these stages, you're sort of weeding out concepts. So, oh, well, that's not feasible. I'm taking it out. You know, if your idea was to use nuclear fusion to power your coffee maker and you had 500 concepts based on nuclear fusion, uh, the minute you take fusion out, those 500 go out with it. Okay, so that's what we're talking about, feasibility assessment, whether the technology is ready. There may be other factors. I mean, the technology may be ready, but it's going to cost too much. Or, you know, it's going to need to come from a supplier that has a back order and it's going to take six months and we've got to get this product out next month. So, uh, that's what we call go no go screening, where we look at the broader factors. Once you've got maybe six or seven concepts, or maybe ten, uh, you can do a much more detailed analysis. So there are two tools that I'll just spend a few minutes talking about. Uh, one that's called the selection matrix, and the other that's called the scoring matrix. All right, this is the selection matrix. So suppose that you're making a machine that meters medicine into a human, uh, and don't even worry about what these are, but this is concept A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I'm comparing them one against the other. You define one of them as your baseline. That's D, your reference. You take those requirements from your QFD here on the left, and you rate them against the reference. So design C is worse than the reference with respect to ease of handling. Uh, design B is better than the reference with respect to portability. And you can add them up. And the clear winners, you move on to the next stage. The losers may have some good aspects. So you can combine with uh, others. Right? So you know, one uh, concept may not be moving forward, but you know, the re readability of the settings on this one was really good. So we're going to take that and combine it with our reference. We're going to come up with a new concept. So this is using a selection matrix. And once you've brought a few forward then, in this case, uh, just looking at A and E, and then you've got a couple of combinations here, D and F and, and one uh, G, which is in addition to it. Uh, what you can do is now take those same selection criteria and then weight them. And then you can uh, come up with a, a weighted score. So if I've got a reference um, product, I give it ratings of three in all categories. Well, in terms of ease of use, the second concept here, DF, uh, that's a little bit better. right? So then I can multiply the, uh, the weight times the rating, and I can get a weighted score, and I can add it up, and I can say, all right, you know, this one is by far the best. Now, when you do this sort of thing, it's kind of obvious. The numbers are arbitrary. So you know, there's no difference between 3.1 and 3.05. Right, so there's always uncertainty here, uh, but it's a way to structure and communicate uh, designs. It's also a way to find biases. If the one design that you think, or maybe your boss thinks, that okay, that's the one that's got to move forward, and you can actually do this in reverse. So, well, to move that one forward, this would have to be rated really high in readability of settings. Oh, 
that must be what my boss is thinking, right? It's a very useful tool. Because if you don't want to go forward with that design, then you, you got to communicate it through the other selection criteria and going back to you know, what you think the customer might want. Okay? So this is a scoring matrix. And it brings us you know, all the way through to the end then. We've got quality function deployment up front. We can use the lids wheel and functional decomposition to come up with concepts. We can use uh, streamlined LCA. You'll know what that is next week. Uh, we can use past experience. We could use full LCA if we have the time to do that. Most of you know it takes six months and at least 100 grand uh, to do a good LCA. And in the product development process, you may not have that time. You know, if this is just an incremental design, it may be OK. But uh, and you're just changing one thing, make a comparison, fine. Uh, so usually you use LCA for products that already exist. And again, the decomposition approach can be used uh, for products that already exist too, just like we talked about with the coffee mix. Right. These are some tools. Uh, this is a process. Uh, I want to embed this into what I'll call the master process. This is a uh, system advocated by the uh, Technical University of Denmark. Uh, but before we do that, I want to make sure everybody understands the main ideas here. Are there any questions? Comments? Give me a minute. It's clear? All oh, right. So uh, I didn't give you uh, enough to understand what's actually going on in the, in the little bullets here. Uh, a pew chart is, who can tell us what a pew chart is? Go ahead. Our graph that uh, shows the relative uh, like importance or whatever you want to show, like it compares different things in a, like a bar graph ranking. Exactly. So you may have different characteristics of your, your product. And what you can do is just rank one against the other against the other and tally them up. And usually it's often used if you've got a problem, you know, in like a Pareto kind of a sense, where, oh, you know, this is, the, you know, I'm getting the most defect calls here, so I better look at that. It's that kind of an analysis. Yes. Yeah. I might have missed this, but in the um, scoring chart, is that sort of a subjective, Very you know, subjective. all the options? Yeah. Kind of Where did these weights come from? And there's a hundred. There's as many ways to do that as there are people in the room. And you know, you might end up on a design team. There's a lot of different ways to do it. If you're really interested, that podcast uh, gives you about four ways of doing it. OK, so uh, I, I think the moral here is that you need some process. I don't care what process you use, uh, but you, know, you need to be able to communicate this. If, you're the, you know, if you've got people working for you, as I'm guessing everybody will at some stage in their career, you, know, you want to be able to communicate the process that's going to lead to the kind of outcomes that you want. And even if they don't come up with the outcomes you want, at least you know how that team got to that concept. And you can deconstruct it. They say, oh, you weighted that too high. So uh, let's think about weighting this. Oh, we don't have data from the customers. And maybe they don't think that's important. Maybe they do. You go out, you do a survey. It becomes a management tool. And it's the same way in uh, sustainable design. Okay, how did you come up with the fact that, you know, that aluminum intensive vehicle is better than uh, the conventional steel vehicle? There's assumptions embedded in there. If you follow a process, you can find out what those assumptions were. And again, these environmental problems are massive. They're combinatorial. You want the ability to trace them backwards. And especially if, you know, again, that work's being done for you, you want to be able to uh, parse it out. That's why a process is really important. And again, the Technical University of Denmark has done a great job uh, putting together a guide. This is a book. Uh, you have not only the book online as a PDF, uh, you have some slides about the book uh, there. So this is an optional reading. And I'm going to give you the upshot of it right here. It's a seven-step plan to sustainable design. The first step is to think about who's using the product, the use context. Where is it being used? 
just like step zero in the lids diagram, right? It's like sort of rethinking it. You know, you need to know who's using the product uh, to uh, be able to make those kinds of decisions. So that's their first step. Their second step is called overview. So instead of just thinking about who's going to use the product, think about the whole life cycle. And think about the stakeholders who are engaged in the whole life cycle. And their third step then is not to do a life cycle assessment, but to try to figure out qualitatively what are the environmental attributes of concern, or there may be health and safety or broader sustainability attributes of concern. So they call that the eco profile. Step four, uh, and this is the step that I think is really important, the stakeholder network. Right? You may have identified one component in your supply chain as being your environmental headache, and there may not be a thing you can do about it, at least in the short term. So you know, the point here is drawing a network among all the stakeholders so you know what you can influence and what you can't, and at least you take action where you can, longer term, and you make the kinds of changes you need to. So step four is drawing that stakeholder network. Step five, then, is that quantification. It is that LCA or streamlined LCA tool that help you uh, understand quantitatively what it means to move forward with design A relative to B relative to C. A key thing they emphasize here is the generation of scenarios. And that's why this step four is so important, because if you've got your stakeholder network, you can, you're, you're in tune to think more broadly than your narrow assumptions, right? I think global warming is the most important for this product. I think water is. If you bring the broader stakeholders in, you can uh, come up with different metrics, different ways of evaluating your design, and you're going to come up with a more robust outcome that way. So linking step four into step five is really important. You know, that one coffee maker example uh, would have missed washing the coffee pot. So if uh, you, know, you had a broader uh, group of people sitting at the table, uh, you might have thought of that and uh, you know, maybe put a warning label on your coffee pot, made it, made it self-cleaning, used different materials, and you know, start thinking about new concepts that are generated uh, from this combination of having a wide range of interests sitting at the table and the quantification. Uh, then you go out and do something about it. All right, we know where the problems are. We're going to come up with concepts, just as we did with the coffee maker. All right, so this is uh, you know, a way of coming up with designs. Their step seven is all about trying to influence the corporate decision making. So don't think about your product just as a product. And engineers just want to think narrow, right? This is my product. I'm designing it. This is the best thing since sliced bread. Step seven here is challenging you to think about that product in terms of corporate strategy. Because you're a lot more likely to get these innovations implemented if you can get the higher ups to agree that this is part of the vision of the corporation. So they call that step seven. So we've thrown lots of acronyms at you today. And the last thing I want to say here is that it's all the same thing. Okay? Uh, this is essentially the decomposition approach. Understanding the product is steps one through four. Understanding the impacts is step five. Doing something about it is six and seven. The lids wheel shows up here. Step six, I didn't add that here. And that's pretty much everything we've talked about 